Hello everyone, today we've got another video on trial by combat in the Middle Ages. Now I've got a lot to cover today, so I do not have a lot of time for recap, but I wanna very briefly cover two things, what we've already talked about and what we're gonna be talking about today. So what I've already covered in previous videos are what role did trial by combat play in the medieval legal system. And I've also covered the differences between criminal and civil trial by combat generally. Now today what we're gonna do is get into the specifics of trial by combat. We're gonna be looking at the process for instituting a trial by combat from the very beginning, right from lodging the complaint in the court all the way up until the combat is actually fought. And we're gonna be looking at the variances from country to country and also how it changed and evolved over time in certain countries. So without further ado, let's jump right into medieval trial by combat in the Middle Ages, starting with lodging the complaint in the court. Boop, boop, boop. So you want to engage someone in trial by combat. Well, before we can even get to the procedures of that, you're relying on one big assumption. Your opponent's going to even show up to court in the first place. So our threshold issue is what happens if the other person is just a no-show? Pretty much the standard rule across the board is that if the other party doesn't show up, you take the same complaint to the court three times in a row. If after three separate occasions, the person fails to show up, well then judgment is automatically entered against them. That person is outlawed. And that's pretty standard throughout the Middle Ages and across countries. It's the same in England as it is the Holy Roman Empire. Let's say that the other person does show up. Well, now you've got a court case on your hands. And with a trial by combat, there are two major parts to the court case. The first part, the pleadings. The pleadings are essentially the part where you get to state your case before the judge and the other person gets to state theirs. Now there's one requirement that shows up pretty much everywhere. It is necessary during the pleading stages for you to say, and I offer to prove my claim by my body. Those are the magic words, by my body. Those were the medieval words that meant I declare or demand trial by combat. All right, so the person bringing the claim offers to prove it by their body. What options does the defendant have? Well, first, the defendant has a requirement if they want to avoid judgment right then and there. You have to deny the other person's claim word by word. If you refuse to deny the claim word by word, your defense was invalid. And this was also an opportunity for the defendant to offer to prove their claim by their body. And sometimes, even if the plaintiff hadn't offered to prove their claim by their body, the defendant could speak up and say, I offer to prove my defense by my body. Now, there are also a number of things that you could have done in your defense besides saying, I demand to prove my defense by my body. For one, there were a plethora of options that varied from country to country in terms of when you could deny going to a trial by combat. We've already discussed some in a previous video. In England, if you were a Norman being challenged to a trial by combat by Anglo-Saxon, you didn't have to go to trial by combat. You could swear an oath instead. In Scotland, we see a few similar rules. Nobles could always deny challenges to trial by combat if it came from someone who is of a status less than them. Now, that doesn't mean that nobles are always off the hook. A noble challenging another noble, you don't have the option to swear off trial by combat. But if you are a noble and a peasant challenges you, well, you have the option to swear an oath instead of going to trial by combat and letting the jury weigh your credibility. In Scotland, we also see another very interesting rule pop up. If you are a a Burgess. That means if you were a citizen of a city and someone outside of that city, a non-Burgess, challenges you to trial by combat in your city, then you didn't have to go to trial by combat. You could swear an oath instead, unless it was a charge of treason. That was the only exception to this rule. In the Holy Roman Empire, we also see the rule about nobles being able to deny challenges by non-nobles. Another rule that we see coming out of the Holy Roman Empire is that you could deny challenges by family members. And right here, this is one of the first points that I want to talk about evolving over time. The rule of not having to fight a relative first appears in a 13th century Germanic law treatise called the Sachsenspiegel. Now, the reason that I named that one by name is because it's going to come up a lot. The Sachsenspiegel was written in the mid-1200s and it was meant to categorize the Germanic laws prior to that point. So it's not statutory laws. It was meant to be a treatise that was talking about the historical laws of the Germanic peoples. As such, some of it can be applied to England, France, Scotland, but by and large, we also get other law treatises in England, France, and Scotland, which is why I'm mostly just applying the Sachsenspiegel to the Holy Roman Empire. Now, one of the reasons that we can see the evolution of trial by combat in the Holy Roman Empire over time is that another historical source points to trial by combat much later down the road in the 1400s, and those are the fighting manuals written by Hans Talhofer. 
In some of the sections of Hans Tallhofer's fighting manuals, we see divergent details and differences from the Soxenspiegel with respect to trial by combat. So with respect to this particular issue, denying a challenge issued by a family member, Hans Tallhofer adds one detail that's absent from the Soxenspiegel, and that's a degree of specificity on how related they have to be. Hans Tallhofer specifies that it has to be within five degrees of relation to the person. And one other major key difference is that the Soxenspiegel seems to indicate that the rule was permissive, that you were allowed to deny a trial by combat issued from a family member, whereas Hans Tallhofer, the language seems to indicate that it wasn't permissive, it was absolute, that you could not go to trial by combat. It wasn't a choice. If you were related to the other person within five degrees, you were not permitted to go to trial by combat against them. Another major change that we see in the trial by combat system for all countries as time goes on and as the system evolves is that trial by combat becomes available only in a select few types of cases. And what these cases are vary across the board, but there's a pretty consistent theme to them in that they have to be pretty infamous cases. For example, in France in 1306, we see a limitation put on trial by combat to where four requirements have to be met in the pleading stages. One, the crime must be homicide, treason, or another serious or infamous crime. Two, the crime must be capital. That means that it's a crime that is otherwise deserving of capital punishment. It couldn't be mere larceny or burglary, no matter how much was stolen or burglarized. Three, the judge had to be satisfied that combat was the only way to maintain a conviction. In other words, justice demanded it. And four, despite a lack of evidence, the accused was notoriously suspected of the deed. So we start to see the tests becoming stricter and stricter to where we still have this method in the legal system, but it's used very sparingly. We also see this in the Holy Roman Empire. Hans Talhofer's fighting manual has a huge difference from the Soxenspiegel in that it says that trial by combat was once allowed across the board, but now is considered to be a viable option only in seven cases. And that is the case of murder, betrayal, heresy, disloyalty to a lord, embracing strife, and the like, which probably means serious crimes of disorder such as starting riots or revolutions, false representations, and the violent treatment of women. Only in these seven cases could someone offer to prove their claim by their body and proceed to a trial by combat. But now we've made it through the pleading stages. Both parties have submitted their cases before the court and said, I offer to prove my claim by my body. Well, traditionally, this is where the judge will declare that a trial by combat is to be held. And now we have a very key component in the trial by combat process, the exchange of the gauges, or sometimes called the exchange of the wads. <laughs> Now, the original Germanic tradition for the exchanging of the wads or the exchange of the gauges was to take off a glove and exchange it with your opponent. Essentially, the thought behind this was that you were putting up a security, basically ensuring that the other person would show up to the fight. The thought being that gloves come in pairs. I'm going to give you one of my gloves, thereby rendering my pair of gloves useless promising to you that I will show up on the day of the fight. And that's where these two words come from. Gage, meaning security, or wad, likely being an early Germanic form of glove. Now, first off, you might just be saying, well, this is just a silly medieval ritual. Why is this so important? The exchanging of the gauges had important legal significance because it was considered the point of no return. Once the judge had declared trial by combat, the parties could still back out. However, once wads or gauges had been exchanged, there was no going back. In England and Scotland, we do eventually see some shift away from exchanging gloves to actually putting up monetary securities for the other person to show up. That is, you pay a fee to the court, essentially promising, hey, I'm gonna show up to the fight so that I can come back to the court and collect this once we're done. In civil cases, this would usually be the amount of money in controversy, which makes sense. You put up the amount of money that the other person allegedly owes you or that you allegedly owe them, and you collect at the very end when you're proven victorious. There is so much variation to this, and there's also a few wacky examples. One particular example comes from England in a treason case, and the exchanging of the wads took place like this. 
Both champions were required to take a glove and each put a coin in every single finger of the glove. He was then required to roll his sleeve up above his elbow so that his elbow and his entire forearm was exposed, take the glove, run into the court, and toss it to the judge on the bench. The French tradition post-1306 was not to exchange gloves with your opponent, but actually for the accuser to throw down his glove on the ground and have the defendant pick it up. The defendant would then take it to the place of battle on the day and offer it back. And fun fact, this tradition is where we get the phrase throwing down the gauntlet. In France, because we have this difference, we don't have the exchange. This part of the trial took place before the judge declared trial by combat. As a matter of fact, it was the event that actually allowed the judge to start the formal investigation proceedings. So in France, this ritual wasn't the point of no return. For France, the point of no return was the judge declaring trial by combat. Everywhere else, pretty much the point of no return was the exchanging of the wads or the exchanging of the gauges. So there were, of course, wacky examples, and it may just seem like a very petty ritual, but the exchanging of the wads or the exchanging of the gauges carried with it a lot of legal significance. And now, since we've reached the point of no return, it's time to talk about what do we do on the day of the fight. So at long last, trial by combat has been declared, and it is the day of the fight. But before we can fight we have some pre-fight rituals. One that we see pretty consistently throughout is making the combatants shave their heads in anticipation of trial. Now there's actually some conflicting viewpoints on this. Some hypothesize that this might have been out of a sign of reverence. It was exposing oneself before everyone else and God and allowing God to judge who was the victor. However, the more predominant view is that it was a sign of shame. Trial by combat was heavily, heavily, heavily disfavored in the medieval legal system, especially if a person was of nobility. Being bareheaded in front of a large crowd of people is going to be pretty embarrassing. But I digress. Pretty much the first step once you arrive on the field of battle the day of is to enter the arena and announce your readiness. And there was typically a pretty specific procedure that announcing your readiness followed. For Scotland in particular, we actually get a very specific picture of what this looked like. Both fighters enter the lists, a wooden ring that had been set up and arranged to be the boundary of the fight. Typically, you had the judges and other spectators elevated on platforms outside of the lists. Now, in Scotland, we have treatises that say that both fighters were to enter the ring. The defendant, or the defendant's champion, would hold out his left hand and grasp the right hand of the plaintiff or the plaintiff's defendant. A person would stand in between them, and the words that were actually used were quad non distringat ipsum. Pardon my Latin, probably butchered that. But quad non distringat ipsum meant so as to not strain. Essentially, this has been interpreted a number of ways. One, so that the combatants don't go ahead and start fighting right then and there. You have a person essentially standing between them to keep the peace so the fight doesn't start prematurely. Or two, so that the person doesn't try to squeeze his opponent's hand so hard as to try and injure his hand before the fight. After that, we have some pretty standard swearing of oaths. Typically, they would make you swear an oath that the charges that you were bringing against the other person or your defense was true. Once again, you had to state your claim before the court, and this time before the court and God, who is going to be deciding your fate. Because of that, we typically have swearing on some type of biblical image. In England and Scotland, it was a Bible. In France, we usually see it being a crucifix. And you also had to swear oaths to a plethora of other things. One common one was swearing that you hadn't eaten or drinking anything that day. Again, another pre-trial ritual along with the shaving of heads that tended to point towards either humility or towards shame. You also had to swear that you were not carrying any weapons that had curses or hexes placed on it. Yes, by and large, medieval people believed that you could have cursed weapons, and they didn't want you bringing cursed weapons into a fight that was to be decided by God. Once the oaths were sworn, we're ready for the fight. So now we're to the actual combat, but the combat could look very different depending on when it took place, where it took place, and also what type of case you're dealing with. So first, let's start off with what weapons and armor were you allowed? Now, one thing that we see in the Holy Roman Empire treatises, that is, in the Sachsenspiegel and also in Hans Talhofer's fighting manual, is a general rule of fairness. And that rule is that weaponry could be supplied to you by the court. 
If you don't have your own weapons and you're not fully equipped to take on this trial by combat, the court will still supply weapons and armor for you. Now, in the early days in the Holy Roman Empire, in the Saxonspiegel, we see very little armor and weaponry for the combatants. First, the combatants could wear as much linen or leather as they would like. It's specified as for their limbs that their heads and their feet must be bare, no helmets. On their hands, they were only allowed to wear leather gloves. As for weaponry, they were allowed to have one shield, one unsheathed sword, and up to two swords tucked into their belt. But as time moves on, we see this change. In Hans Talhofer's fighting manual, we get visual depictions of what a trial by combat looks like in his day. Based on Hans Talhofer's depictions, we can conclude that the preferred mode of trial by combat was armored, or possibly that it was either armored or unarmored depending on the situation or status of the parties. Now, unlike the Saxonspiegel, we do not actually have a verbatim description of this, of what the rules were for armor and weapons in a judicially sanctioned duel. These are my own conclusions based on observations, so I'll explain my reasoning real quick. To start, we've got three separate manuals by Hans Talhofer that talk or depict trial by combat explicitly. That is explicitly depicting the process for a judicially sanctioned duel, each with its different art style and art depictions with some slight variations in them. Now, each time that Hans Talhofer mentions judicial combat specifically, specifically talking about trial by combat, the combatants are seen armored. And yet other times, even when not specifically mentioning trial by combat, we can infer that that's the setting based on other context clues, such as the person's teachers and coaches putting them into the casket that they had had prepared beforehand at the beginning of the fight. And sometimes we get this imagery associated with unarmored combatants. We also see unarmored combatants fighting in lists, though I don't think that that's the strongest argument, mainly because we see other things taking place in the list, such as this, a person mounted with a javelin versus a another mounted person with a crossbow, likely not going to fly in a trial by combat because again, we have that general rule of fairness of not liking people to be on unequal footing in the fight. That, coupled with the fact that we have the same techniques being depicted in other manuals by Hans Talhofer without the lists, makes it really hard to know when the lists are there to show the actual setting of a trial by combat and when they're just there for artistic effect. And at the very least, we can conclude that the system evolved and moved away from the Saxonspiegel, where we're now seeing people fighting in armor and using a wide variety of weapons such as long swords, spears, great shields, war hammers, and pole axes. We see some depictions of mounted combat, both in armor and unarmored. Again, hard to know when exactly this is trying to depict a trial by combat and when it's just battle techniques, but we do know that the judge also had a wide variety of discretion, and in Hans Talhofer's manual, there is one other depiction where we see trial by combat. And it's a trial by combat between a man and a woman. Now, the interesting thing about this is that they're actually not depicted with the same weaponry. The judge, being the arbiter of fairness, has the man standing inside of a hole up to his waist and using a wooden club, while a woman is going around with a very large stone in a sack cloth, swinging it around like a flail presumably to try to give the woman an advantage in the fight. So it's possible that some of these things that we're seeing with armored versus unarmored combatants and all of these different things are all meant to depict trials by combat. But I think at the very least, it's pretty safe to say that unlike the Saxonspiegel, which dictates only linen or leather and a sword and shield, we are now seeing fights in both armor and unarmored, and we are also seeing a wide variety of weapons being used. Turning now to France, the most common mode of battle was an armored joust for both criminal and civil trial by combat. Post-1306, this is pretty much the only mode of combat that we see, although there is some evidence that trials by combat took place on foot beforehand. For example, the trial by combat between Jean de Carouge and Jacques Legree, the subjects of the novel and movie The Last Duel, had to have lists specially constructed for them for their joust. And it was said that these lists were constructed to be like some of the lists of trials by combat in the past, but had to be expanded to allow the horses to ride in them because the older ones were meant for combatants on foot. But at the very least, post-1306, one of the things that makes France so unique from all of the other countries is that its prime mode of trial by combat is a joust rather than a duel on foot. In Scotland, the primary weaponry and armor that we're dealing with is a spear, a sword, a targe, and a helmet. And England we see typically following the same rules as Scotland and the Holy Roman Empire. But again, with some exceptions, the judge being the arbiter of what's fair. Perhaps the most hilarious medieval case that I have ever read comes from Thomas Wythorn versus James Fisher. 
Now, this case is noted in the Chronicle of William Gregory. The best guess that we have is that the procedure for the following case was intended to dissuade people from taking their cases to trial by combat. Because once the judge allowed the combatants to go to trial by combat, here are the terms that he set. Both combatants were forced to find the most sorry piece of land about the town to fight on. They were to dress from head to foot, including hands and face, in white sheep's leather. They were to fight with three foot long batons tipped with curved pieces of iron shaped like ram's horns. They were to fast before the fight. And this next part's a quote. If any man should need any drink, they must take his own piss. Both combatants were to dress up as woolly sheep, fight with iron ram's horns, and if they needed to eat or drink before the fight, they were forced to drink their own urine. And William Gregory noted that there were some parts of the fight procedure that he could not even put into writing because of how shameful they were. Wide amounts of discretion in dictating the rules for trial by combat. So there are the general rules for how the combatants are armed and how they approach the fight. Let's talk about some of the rules of engagement. A pretty standard thing that you see across the board is that the combatants are to be facing north and south at the start of the fight. Reason being is that if you're facing north and south, regardless of what time of the day it is, there's no chance of the sun being in your eyes. Now, in France, England, and Scotland, they mention north and south specifically. In the Holy Roman Empire, all of the treatises that we have just say facing each other to where the sun's not in your eyes. So if it's overcast, probably doesn't matter. The point is we want both combatants starting on even playing field. We don't want to give either of them any advantage. Another pretty common rule is that Outsiders are not allowed to intervene in the fight. And this was a pretty serious offense. Hans Talhofer notes that once the combatants have entered the ring, all coaching and advice must cease. It had to stop immediately. Traditionally, you would also have deputies and executioners that stood outside of the ring. Falling outside of the ring is another thing that there's some discrepancy on. Sometimes pushing your opponent out of the ring meant that you won. You had won the trial by combat, but there were different rules at different times. Hans Talhofer, for one, notes that if any part of a person's body fell outside of the list during a fight, that the executioners had the right to cut off that part of their body. So it's generally a good idea during the fight to stay inside the lists. Now, the fight could have been ended in many ways. As we saw in criminal versus civil trial by combat, not all trial by combats were to the death. In the Holy Roman Empire, Hans Talhofer describes that the fight could have been ended by surrendering, by exiting the arena, or by death. But again, this is where there's some discrepancy because Hans Talhofer also notes that if any part of your body flies out of the ring, the executioner can cut it off. The ancient Norse tradition, on the other hand, was first blood. England, Scotland, and France somewhat differed in this. Now here is where we actually have the records for England, not for Scotland and France, but Scotland and France likely followed this rule, that it was either to the death or to the surrender. But in Scotland, we do have treaties that note one extra rule, a time limit. The burden of proof is on the accuser, the plaintiff. And so because of that, they had a limited time window in which to either kill their opponent or make their opponent surrender. That limit was traditionally until the end of the day. If the person could survive a combat for the entire day, they could be let go as innocent. In Scotland, we also have copious records of the trial by combat system, so there were a number of other exceptions. An appeal of adultery could be stopped at any point if the alleged adulterer admitted to the fault and paid a fine. So at any point along the way, as long as the adulterer admits that they're at fault and pays a court fine, trial by combat's over. And we have special rules for certain clans even. In any fights concerning someone from Clan Macduff, if a person, a third party spectator, was able to pass between the accuser and his spear for some reason, well then the fight was off. And there were also exceptions to rules to when, even if no blood was drawn, exhaustion could end the fight. A visible exhaustion on either combatant could cause the judge to declare the fight to be over. And again, this is gonna change between criminal and civil trial by combat. In England, we see fights being unarmored for criminal trial by combat, yet armored for civil trial by combat. It's to the death for criminal, but not to the death for civil. So all of these rules are going to vary depending on what the proceeding actually is. And as a last final note, we should talk about what happens when you win. Well, sad news. Even if you win, that does not mean that you get off scot-free. If you were the plaintiff, the person bringing the complaint, well, then you probably did just walk away no problem. If you were the defendant though, Traditionally, the system went, mm, we know you won the trial by combat and all, but 
we're still not entirely sure that you're innocent. That's right. Traditionally, your reward as a defendant winning trial by combat, especially in a criminal matter, was that you were banished from the realm, or at the very least from the county. You had to abjure the realm. That was the big legal term, abjure the realm. Or sometimes you got to go free, but it was at the cost of a very hefty court fine. Regardless, if you're the defendant and you win, you're probably not getting away scot-free. And even if you are the plaintiff, you might also have to pay that fine. You're not getting away scot-free either. And again, that's mostly for civil. Criminal trial by combat's gonna look a little bit different because it's kind of like sports gambling with champions. And that's another thing that we're gonna be seeing pretty consistent across the board, country to country. Trial by combat was not a favored form of judgment. People didn't just say, oh, he won, he must be innocent. They didn't trust it. Even though it was a tradition for them, even though it was part of their system, they still viewed it with a skeptical eye and only used it in exceedingly rare circumstances. And with that, we have the full process for trial by combat, starting with the complaint in the court and ending with the combat itself. Well, thank you everybody so much for watching. That is the end of the video. You know, going back and editing all of those clips, I cannot believe how many times I said standard and across the board. And believe me, I cut out half of them. So the final version has a, half as many as I actually had. Um, but yeah, no, this one took me a long time. Obviously, this video is a lot longer, but um, hopefully you guys enjoyed this trial by combat series. I'm going to be trying to branch out into a few new topics. I have a, an, a, an idea for a few new series um, that I'm planning on doing in the future. But if you guys have any suggestions, any questions, anything in the comments that you think that I missed, uh, leave a, a comment and I will try to answer it. But appreciate you guys watching.